All right, it's time to start. Welcome. I'm recording. We're good. Uh, before we go into our class, our last night, everybody go yay. Okay, yeah, that's not very exciting, guys. I went yay. I know Jackson's happy. I'm happy. Uh, I am ready for the holidays. I really am. It's that time of year. You're like, man, I just want to rest. Uh, but uh, appreciate you guys and everybody, uh, uh, their diligence and their uh, effort. So it's not an easy class. You know, you talk about Hebrew or Greek. I mean, that's people kind of cringe, uh, especially Hebrew. So uh, appreciate you guys and uh, uh, your diligence and sticking it out and uh, and these kind of things. So uh, I hope it's been worth your time. Uh, I think it's a valuable and useful study. It's not going to make you Hebrew or Greek experts or scholars per se, but it gets you uh, uh, some elementary uh, tools that opens some doors uh, and, and enables you to use that in your ministry and your study. Uh, and that's really what it's been, what it's been about. Hopefully it, it, it uh, should you decide to go further in your Greek or your Hebrew, you'll already have a pretty firm plant uh, foundation, uh, feet planted pretty firmly in order to uh, uh, pick it up a little faster than someone who has, this, doesn't have his background. So uh, be uh uh, worthwhile if you decide to go that uh, route. Uh, let's, before we can begin, let's go to our Father in prayer. Uh, I know we have uh, uh, many are struggling with COVID. It's certainly been, seems to be uh, uh, spiking in some areas. Uh, I talked to Phil Sanders today and it's spiking where he's at. He's still planning on coming in January, uh, but we've talked about alternatives should it be a problem. Uh, and uh, uh, but I know that uh, there's still a concern, it still exists, it's not gone away, uh, but hopefully a uh, vaccine will be out the next month or so and uh, gets distributed widely and then we can sort of move back to some semblance of normal, normalcy, hopefully. Um, anyone that uh, we want to mention specifically? <laughs> hey Dave, we might keep the Brown Trail School of Preaching and Prayer with uh, yeah. past one of their um, instructors from COVID. Yeah, uh, Odie Rodriguez, yeah. is that right? Uh, yeah, I think that was his name. Yeah, uh, yeah, they had, uh, I guess, a, a few that uh, became infected and one of them, uh, I guess, passed away this morning or passed away recently, I saw on Facebook, I don't know. Uh, so I remember them. Let's go to Father Prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this avenue of prayer, this opportunity to come humbly before your throne, uh, to come boldly, knowing that you hear our prayers, Father, and grateful for your Son and his willingness to give us all to sacrifice that we can have this right relationship with you. We're thankful, Father, for your continued providential care and uh, the opportunity to study more of your word and study the original languages, biblical language that you made uh, your word available in. We pray, Father, your, uh, your uh, wisdom be applied uh, to us that we could uh, discern uh, properly and apply it in our lives and our ministries. I pray, Father, your blessings upon all uh, who are studying uh, this uh, in this class. I pray especially those for who are having difficulties in this life and those dealing with COVID, those in the front lines and those having health issues. Uh, pray, Father, your blessing upon them that this uh, uh, virus can be uh, uh, eradicated in the near term. Uh, that we not have to continue at uh, much longer in this distant form. Uh, Father, we pray especially for those at the Brown Trail School of Preaching who have contracted COVID and, and the family uh, of the one who has passed, uh, uh, Mr. Rod Brother Rodriguez, for your blessings upon this family and the, those there. Thankful, Father, for your love, and uh, we ask that you look after us and look after our uh, brethren at the respective congregations. Uh, that we would all turn and look to you in all things. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're into our final night. And uh, uh, so we're at session 14. Hey, Russ, how you doing? Uh, and uh, so we're going to just walk through a review. Again, this is not intended to be a uh, like a Hebrew grammar class, but it is intended for you to have some familiarity. So I continue to do the same basic review, although I have, in fact, uh, uh, have, in fact, uh, uh, shrunk it down a little bit. Uh, uh, so, but if you remember when we uh, we were looking at three uh, for the Hebrew uh, uh, 
morphology, we're looking at three major areas, the root, the stem or binyan, binyanim, or, and the conjugations. Uh, and so of the root is, uh, carries the basic underlying meaning, that's uh, the words that are derived from it. Uh, and uh, in the verbal system, uh, the root uh, will uh, have, uh, we typically look at seven different stems or binyan or binyanim. Uh, and the first one is the call, which normally is referred to as a simple stem and it's called simple because the other stems are derived from it. And so that's why you basically uh, see it's, uh, it's normally taught first and then all the other uh, stems or binyan are actually uh, a derivative of it. And so you can see the variations. And I try to emphasize that so it kind of helps build uh, your understanding or my understanding of the call stem and, and those that uh, helps us to recognize uh, the other related stems. The conjugations, uh, there uh, are really uh, eight although we're focusing on two, the perfect and the imperfect. Uh, the significance of the conjugations uh, is uh, they uh, define uh, uh, how the word is used in context, uh, whether it's being something in the uh, completed action, incompleted action, imperative, a command, or these kind of things. Uh, so uh, we mentioned it about the root, and you can both the nouns and the verbs form from the root, uh, you know, like the, the root to the mem, the lamed, and the uh, final cough. It's not technically a word. That's why we say mem, lamed, and final cough. Uh, and it does carry on its, the semantic meaning, but that meaning doesn't really apply until you basically uh, uh, build the noun or the verb. Uh, and that's when you add the, uh, the pointers to it, uh, such as in the nouns of melek, uh, maka for queen, and uh, makut uh, for kingdom. Uh, in the verb form uh, would be uh, malak, uh, and that is, would be terrain. And so you see how it, one derives from the root. Uh, and then the verb stem, or the binyan, uh, we looked at uh, uh, a few so far. The significance about the stem is you're looking at the type of action. And that's really, Hebrew isn't as, the, the verb itself isn't as uh, emphasizing the uh, 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 the action, whether it would be emphasizing past, present, or future. It's not emphasizing the temporal uh, component or characteristics, but it's emphasizing the type of action and the type of voice. Uh, simple action, intensive action, causative action, active, passive, or reflective voice. It's not that time doesn't exist uh, in he Hebraic thought or Hebraic language, uh, but it's embedded in the context uh, and not directly associated with simply the verb as where in Greek, especially the indicative uh, mood, you would have more of the, uh, uh, the temporal aspects associated with it. So when you look at uh, simple action, uh, we group this like the call uh, in for is an active voice, simple action. And the nephal is also a simple action, but it's a passive voice. And that's why we started with call and moved to nephal. It's both simple action, but we go one is the active voice, the other is passive. Intensive action, uh, you're intensifying the action, you slam the door, you, 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 you smash the, the window, uh, you know, the action has been intensified in some form or uh, repetitive in some form. And so uh, we started with the PL because that's also, it's intensive, but it's active voice. But to make it that same intensive action passive, we'd go to the PUL. And uh, tonight we'll look at the hip file. I, I, I debated and I almost clued the hop file, the hope file. Uh, simply because uh, if I L is a causative action, it's, it's causing, cause someone to be uh, a king, uh, and the active voice, you, you made him king, and the passive voice would be the hope file, uh, uh, where uh, he, was, uh, he was made king. Uh, he was crowned, for example. And so there's sort of a, a pretty basic pattern that flows with this, and that's kind of why I wanted to follow that pro approach. This basically, for example, shows that uh, the call is a simple action, active voice, he heard. Well, that's a very simple action, he heard. And it's active, it's something he physically did in some form. To same simple action, but to make it passive, you put in the nephal form. Uh, so he was heard. So shema becomes nishma. Uh, and it's the both for simple action, but one's active and one's passive. That's how they differentiate. 
Uh, if you're going to do the intensive action, active voice is PL. And with the example here, we have uh, she bear. Uh, and the passive or the intensive action would be the PUL. And so shoe bear. Uh, and so he smashed into pieces, or it was smashed into pieces, both active and passive voices. Uh, tonight, we're going to add to that and go to the causative action, the active voices and the hip fail. Uh, and here we had the uh, 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 he leak. Uh, he made someone king, and we're not going to do the hope file, hope file, uh, hope file uh, simply because I feel like I'm just piling on. Uh, but understand the hip file active voice to put that same causative action in a passive voice. You would just simply make it hopeful, uh, and so uh, uh, he leak uh, for the active voice uh, would go passive in the hope file as uh, uh, home. Home lock, uh, yeah, home lock. Uh, that's a comates, uh, uh, or hot tooth comates there, which has an O sound, not an A sound. We're not spending time in the uh, intensive action reflective voice from the hip IL. Uh, it's just another form, as you can see right there. But uh, we also spend time on the conjunctions, conjugation, excuse me, uh, and we're only emphasizing the perfect and the imperfect. Perfect is completed action whether it be past, present, or future, and perfect is an incomplete action, uh, whether it be past, present, or future. Uh, and so that's kind of what we have uh, sort of touched on. Uh, we did mention about the, uh, the word order and the sentence. Uh, typically, English is going to be uh, subject, verb, object. Uh, typically, Hebrew, and I say typically, it certainly does change, but typically, it's going to be verb, subject, object. Uh, even the clauses will generally be verb, subject, object, object. And for here, you have God created the heavens and the earth. In English, that God is a subject and the verb is created and the heavens and the earth are both objects of, uh, direct objects of the verb created. Uh, you see the Hebrew going from right to left, bara is the verb, is first presented. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the subject is Elohim, that is uh, God. So, uh, bara Elohim, eight is the, the next word there. It's not a uh, more translatable word. It's an object marker. That's how we know the next word, Hashamayim, is an object of the verb. And, uh, and then when you have, uh, after that, you have the, uh, uh, the conjunction Vav, uh, which would be and, and you have the same direct object marker, eight, so it's Vait. Uh, the eight is not translated, but the Vav is. And you have the next direct object, uh, Haaretz. And so we have Bara Elohim Eit Hashamayim Vaeit Haaretz. And you have God created the heavens and the earth. It's in Hebrew, it's verb, subject, object. A uh, long way to point that out. Anyway, uh, and when you parse the Hebrew verbs, uh, you're going to parse them in terms of its uh, stem first. It's conjugation next, and then it's uh, person, uh, 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 person, um, gender, and uh, uh, number. Person, gender, and number. So you have, uh, and then the lexical form. So uh, uh, nishma is the nifal, perfect, third masculine singular from the lexical form of shama. Well, shama means uh, to, to, I think that's to hear. So I'm pretty sure it was to hear. Let me go back and double check that. Yeah, or he heard in the perfect form. Uh, to make it passive, you put in the nifal, and so you get nishma, which would be the, uh, he was heard. And uh, what you parse it here would be the perfect, or the nifal, perfect third message, so you're from shama. We okay, buddy, making sense? All right, so you've seen this multiple times. Repetition, 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 uh, at least will help you recognize and be somewhat more familiar. So then you move into the very stems, and like we said, we start with, oh, did I not? There we go. Was I a slide behind when I was talking? No. no. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, the call stem is the, you know, the, the basic uh, uh, stem of which everything is derived from. It's in the perfect conjugation, third masculine singular form. Uh, and they typically use in all the grammars this uh, 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 kof, uh, tet, lamet, uh, root, 
And then they add the uh, pointer, valve pointers, the comates under the first root position and the uh, podic under the second root position and you get katal. Uh, and that means I killed, uh, or uh, it would be third masculine singer would be he killed. Uh, typically, uh, it can be past, present, or future, but typically it's, it's translated in the past. Um, uh, context will tell you what it, the, it, it would change. So, um, I, I do want to emphasize, uh, let's see, what am I at here? I'll go back. Yeah, I do want to mention that the cough is in root position one, the tet is in root position two, and the lamin is in root position three. Why that matters to you is that uh, specifically a lot of the uh, variation is going to occur. Uh, root position two is going to uh, basically be the place where the valves are going to change a lot and give you a lot of the characteristics for certain stems. And so it's kind of, it's useful to recognize that, and, and I just wanted to point that out. Um, you also have, and we're not going to go over the weak consonants, uh, and typically they refer to it as, you know, uh, uh, you know, third position weak uh, hey or yo, or first position weak eight. So uh, knowing what they're talking about, root one, root two, root three, first position, second position, third position, that's really what they're referring to. Um, and we mentioned the perfect is used to express a completed action or a state of being whether it be past, present, and the future, we typically translate it in English, like I mentioned, I wrote in the past, or in the present, I have written. Um, the, uh, to look at uh, the, the paradigm for the call perfect, the third masculine singular is, of course, the top line, he killed, kata. Uh, we add suffixes uh, to it in order to uh, change the, the person, number, and gender. Uh, so a third feminine singular would be adding the comets hey, and it would be um, katala, kat, katla, excuse me, katla. Uh, and so it would be she killed and on down the line. Uh, typically the feminine is going to use the comets hey or a, a tau, uh, excuse me, a tav at the end. Um, and um, uh, you can see the different endings that they use. That pattern is the same pattern they're going to use for the uh, perfect. So if you have a perfect in uh, uh, the nifal, it's going to be the same pattern, uh, same suffixes added to it. Uh, and so for example, when you see, no matter what word you're looking at, you see basically the same pattern. Uh, there are some things that could cause it to change, so I don't want to mislead you, uh, but generally you see the same pattern. Uh, the words at top, uh, yashma, yash, excuse me, uh, yashav, uh, to dwell, uh, zakar, to remember. These are all the third masculine singular, uh, call perfect strong verbs. Uh, katav, uh, to write, shamar, to keep, and kavats, uh, to gather. Uh, and as you can see, the third masculine singular all has the Kamates uh, under the first root position and the padak under the second root position. And that's really your, your uh, identifying markers uh, for uh, the call perfect uh, third masculine singular. If you want to make it third feminine singular, you're going to uh, add to the ending and you're going to add the comates hey. And you can see that's done that for all words. Uh, second masculine singular, you add the, the tav with the comates at the end. That does when you add something in, that is going to change the vowels or the spelling of the other words. Uh, but generally, you sort of get comfortable with that after you've done a few, uh, and you recognize how they change. It's not that, uh, oh, it's not that instrument. It's not insurmountable. Um, and so you see the same pattern across for the perfect across all the different words here and the strong. Uh, third mass, uh, strong uh, call perfect verbs. Uh, to move to the imperfect, the imperfect is something that's incomplete, uh, habitual or customary action, whether it be past, present, or future. In other words, ongoing in some form, or will be ongoing in the future, or is ongoing in the present, uh, or was ongoing in the past. Um, and so in the English, we typically would translate it in the present tense, I study, or the future, I will study. And most of these here, I think, have the future tense. I will study. I think that's the typical. Um, and so when we look at the, how the form, 
We have the same root, the kof, the, uh, kof, the tef, tet, and the lamed, uh, but we add a prefix to it. In this case, the prefix is the yod with the hiric underneath it. The second root position, the tet, has a holum to it now, and those are the identifying markers. And so you get yik tol. By the way, a lot of grammars just call it yik tol. That's what they refer to it as the call imperfect uh, third masculine singer is the yik tol. That's the standard they refer to. Uh, that means uh, katal meant I killed or he killed. Uh, yik tol means he was killed or he will kill. Uh, excuse me, he will kill or uh, he kills. Uh, so it's just changing it to the imperfect, something that's ongoing or habitual or the past, present, or future. Uh, for example, uh, now the suffix uh, to for the number, uh, gender, and uh, a person, third masculine singular, third feminine singular, second masculine singular, and so forth, those are a different pattern than the perfect. The imperfect has its own pattern. And you notice the third masculine singular, the third feminine singular, and the second masculine singular has no suffix, nor does the first common singular, nor does the first common plural. There is no suffix added to it. Um, but there is in the second feminine singular, uh, third masculine plural, uh, third feminine plural, second masculine plural, and second feminine plural. Uh, and it's the same pattern whether you're dealing with the call or the nephal, imperfect. Uh, and so once you sort of begin to recognize the pattern and the changes that are occur, occur with it. Uh, the prefix is the, uh, for the third masculine singular is the yod with the hiric. Um, however, when you get beyond the third masculine singular, most often uh, the yod drops off except for the third masculine plural, and it, instead it has the tav. Uh, so the tav hiric is typical. First common singular and first common plural are almost always different. They're always going to just stand out. Uh, so it has the olive with the uh, 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 um, seray uh, and the and the seray or the segol, excuse me, the segol uh, for the first common singular, and the first common plural is the noon with the hiric. Yeah. So you you know you begin to recognize those, and once you do, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, there are some uh, uh, the the. Third feminine singular and second masculine singular are identical. Uh, and so the only way to know the difference between them is going to be context. The same with the third feminine plural and second feminine plural. So we've gone over all this before. That's why I'm just kind of reading it for the most part. Uh, and, and hopefully it brings a bell and it sounds like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, maybe you can get it through osmosis in your nap. Uh, but that was my joke for the night. Uh, I'm sure I'll think of something else later. For example, uh, in its uh, uh, paradigm with uh, other words, a car to remember, there's the, uh, we're looking first, the top line would be the uh, third masculine singer called perfect. Uh, it's a car to, to remember, uh, katav to write, shamar to keep, uh, uh, kavats to gather, uh, to in that call and make it the imperfect conjugation. Uh, you see the changes that are made to it. It's, uh, you have the, the yod, for the third masculine singular, the yod, uh, hiric underneath it, uh, and the, the, third, the second root position uh, has the hole above it. Uh, and you can see the pattern, uh, the third masculine singular, the second feminine singular, the or sorry, third feminine singular, and the second masculine singular, uh, along with the common uh, singular and plural, uh, have no suffix ending, the others do, but they all follow the same pattern. Uh, why people struggle with Hebrew is because there's a lot. But once you begin to recognize the pattern, it's not so much. It's the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Where you get into trouble is because there's such a lot, and because we haven't even touched weak verbs. Uh, but they have patterns associated with it. And Basically, once you start to recognize what changes and why it changes, it, it really becomes uh, uh, not, not so insurmountable. We looked last week also at the, uh, the nephal. Uh, the nephal is just taking the same uh, call stem and going from an uh, uh, active voice to a passive voice in the nephal. So a nephal stem and a perfect conjugation, perfect once again is gonna be completed action. Uh, so the nephal is simple action with either a passive or reflective voice. Um, 
And it's, it, for example, you have, the, we already saw uh, Nick Tol, Nick Tol, excuse me, uh, in the passive translated, he was killed, or in the reflective, he killed himself. Uh, and uh, so, and then the form, uh, you can see we have on the left here, uh, the uh, katal, the call perfect third national singer. That's a simple, completed action with an active voice to take that simple, completed action and make it passive, we put it in the nephal form. And so we put a prefix with the noon and the hearing underneath it, and we change the, uh, well, in this case, there's no change, uh, but the uh, we have the padak under the second root position. So you get niktal, uh, uh, and it'd be as the same simple completed action. That's what, uh, 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 but it's in the passive voice. And so we see the perfect uh, conjugation, it uses the same uh, endings, the same suffixes that we saw in the call. And so you see on the left side is the call, on the right side is the nephal. And the basic difference is the nephal is we had the, we added the prefix with the, the noon and the heric to it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the, but the suffixes for the perfect conjugation, that is the completed action, are the same as the call. Uh, so once you learn one, you just apply it to the other. Uh, we're not learning it tonight, we're just recognizing it. Uh, and if to move to the imperfect, that is an ongoing. Uh, the imperfect for the call is yikto, uh, simple incomplete action, ongoing, uh, active voice. Uh, in the nephal, you take that incomplete action active and you make it an incomplete action passive. And you get, uh, he cocktail, uh, and so you add the here the yod with the hirik underneath, and you see the defining characteristics here is going to be the yod with the hirik underneath. Now the yod is already in uh, the imperfect for the call, uh, but the hirik underneath and the kamets under the first root position, under the kof here, and the dogish forte. Dogish forte is a doubling in the sound. Remember, so we get yik uh, ka. Tail, he cut tail. Uh, so it's a simple and complete action with a passive voice. And for example, the imperfect knee fall, knee fall imperfect. Uh, you see the call on the left hand side and the knee fall on the right. Uh, notice that the, the, the imperfect suffixes are the same for call and knee fall. Now, the perfect suffixes are not. They're, they're not associated with imperfect, but the imperfect. I don't want to confuse you. Imperfect call uh, suffixes and nephal uh, suffix are the same. Uh, and you see very much the same in the, uh, the prefix. The biggest difference is going to be, notice the dog is forte in the first root position. Now, you can have a problem if you have a guttural in the first root position because it doesn't take a dog, it's a forte or a linde, right? So generally what would happen is the for, that that little dot is not going to be there, but what will happen is there will be compensation for it. Typically, the heric will probably lengthen to some other vowel, uh, and it'd be something that doesn't look the same, and, and uh, that would be your clue, and you have to look a little deeper. So, And uh, so you get, uh, in the future, he will be killed, she will be killed, uh, these kind of things. So. Uh, and then last week we looked at the PL and the PUL. Uh, the PL stem, perfect conjugation, PL is used to express intensive action. So now we move from a simple action, which is the call and the fall, active and passive, to a, a intensive action, PL and PUL. Difference between a PL and PUL is only the voice, active and passive. So the PL stem is used to express intensive action with an active voice. Of, uh, and this shouldn't say uh, uh, passive, it should say uh, the PL uh, Shiber is translated, he smashed into pieces. That should not say passive there, that should say active. That uh, happens when I cut and paste. Make a note so I can fix it someday. Um, and uh, 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 so uh, the PL stem in the perfect conjugation, third masculine singular. We have on the left hand, the katal, uh, simple completed action, active voice. And on the right hand, the PL perfect, strong verb. And you see the changes, the, the, uh, uh, the pointing vowel under the first position, under the kof, 
is a heric instead of the comates. And you also have a dogus forte in the second root position over there with the, the tet. And so that's a uh, uh, keet tail, keet tail. That is an intensive, completed action, active voice. Uh, and so you can do a comparison between the call and the PL and notice that the differences is really is the first position root, uh, first position uh, uh, pointing valve pointer, uh, as well as the second position will have the doggish forte in it. Uh, but it uses the same perfect suffix endings that we've already seen. So once you learn those, it applies multiple times. You haven't learned anything new. Uh, and to change it to an imperfect, and all you're doing here is you're going from a completed action to an incomplete action, to something that's ongoing. Uh, because it's PL, it's still active voice. Uh, so yeet to, it becomes uh, yakatel, yakatel. Uh, they have the vocal shava with the yod, you have the cough with the kama, pod, excuse me, padak, uh, the toff, uh, with the doggish forte and the uh, um, uh, underneath it. Uh, and so it is now an intensive incomplete action, except it, and with the active voice instead of being, uh, uh, instead of being complete action, as we said in PL, it's incomplete action, um, both for active voice though. So a PL imperfect, uh, it's gonna use the imperfect suffix endings just like you've already seen with the call uh, and uh, the knee fall imperfect. Uh, so the PL imperfect is gonna use the same suffix endings. The difference is there's gonna be some changes into the prefix uh, as well as predominantly that root position number two. You, you see a lot of changes in root position two. Uh, and here the doggish forte is in it. Uh, and you have a, uh, the, uh, uh, the paddock uh, under the first root position under the kof and the first root position is typically going to be the shava, whether it be the yod or the tav, uh, but generally have the shava underneath it. And so you get he will slaughter, so something that's ongoing in the future in this case. Am I making sense? I know I'm bored everybody, but questions are I making sense? Yeah. Okay, we're okay. All right, so and then the, now you move, and the PL is the active voice. Now to make it passive, you move to the puel, and that's all you've done. Uh, and here we're going to start with the perfect conjugation. Again, the perfect is going to be something that's an intensive action, passive, uh, yeah, passive voice because we're in the puel. Uh, the puel passive would be shubar, uh, shubar, uh, and it translates, it, he was smashed into pieces. So it's something that's in a passive, not something he did to himself, but was done to him. Um, and the form, well, you're going from on the left to katal, that is, he killed. Uh, to a puel is something that's intensive, uh, but with a passive voice where he was murdered, for example. Um, so this would be uh, kutel, kutal, excuse me, kutal. So that shurik is the U sound. Again, you have the uh, doggish forte in the second root position with the ta tet is, and so you, that's a doubling, so it's kutal. Uh, intensive, completed action, except now it's a passive voice. Uh, and so in, in contrast with the, uh, the call, uh, and you see the, because it's perfect conjugation, the suffix endings are all the same. Whether you're talking about the call, the PL, the PUL, the NIFAL, uh, they're all the same for perfect conjugations that have the same suffixes. Now, when you go to uh, the imperfect, it'll have a different set of suffix endings, but all imperfects will have the same suffix endings. Uh, now, I, I did go back and verify. I knew something wasn't right. Uh, so the Puel, such as uh, Kutal, uh, it should have been, uh, he was slaughtered instead of he slaughtered. That is a, an error in the, uh, uh, specifically in the grammar that I pulled from. Uh, in the book itself, it's correct, but in the PowerPoint they give me, I, I normally modify their PowerPoints and use them in different ways. Uh, uh, to help me uh, in explaining it, uh, but the PowerPoint they give me had it in, inaccurate, so I just added the red. He was slaughtered, she was slaughtered, you were slaughtered, and such. I was slaughtered, um, uh, and, and the Puel perfect, perfect again, typically past 
typically translated past, although it could be present or future, uh, but most often past. Uh, but it is, uh, in, because it's Puel, it's passive. So he was slaughtered. And so hopefully you can see that again. The suffix endings in the perfect are the same, uh, whether you're talking about call, nifal, puel, pl. If it's perfect, they'll have the same suffix endings. To go from puel, passive, uh, imperfect. Uh, imperfect is an incomplete action, but now we're in the passive voice. Uh, yeet to was the call imperfect or masculine singular, a simple, incomplete action, active voice. Now the puel, imperfect, strong verb. Uh, he, uh, excuse me, yakutal, uh, uh, yakutal, yeah, I think it's yakutal, it's not yikut. The, the vocal shava has a, a very quick, uh, a short A sound. Uh, it's actually written like an E, a backwards E is. Uh, so it should be yakutal, yakut tal, yakutal, that should be right. Uh, all you did is make it passive now, and it's still intensive, incompleted action, uh, but now it's a passive voice. Uh, and again, the uh, comparison to the call, uh, once you go imperfect, the, it's a different set of uh, suffix endings, but all imperfects, they use the same set of suffix endings. Uh, so once you figure that out, it's, it's not a nothing new, it's nothing new. What's new is that the, uh, for a puel to recognize it, it has a different prefix. Uh, and what really normally pretty easy because you have that shirt, that U sound on the first root position. Uh, that's where that U sound, that's why it's called pu'al, because you have the U sound in the first position and the podic in the second position, so it's a U-A. So uh, the first, uh, third masculine singer pu'al is uh, uh, yaputal. Uh, he will be slaughtered. Uh, again, it's something that is going to be uh, uh, past, uh, so in this case they're pointing his future, but it is passive, uh, so it's not something he does to himself, but it's something's done to him. So something new tonight, uh, the heat fill, uh, and we're going to see the same thing. Uh, there's a slight, there's a difference in its appearance, but we're seeing the same thing. Now we've seen the simple action in the call and the knee fall, active and passive. We've seen the intensive action in the PL and PUAL, active and passive. Now you see the causative action. And the causative action begins with the active voice in the heat fail. Now, if we were to go on and do the hope fall, uh, it'd be a causative action passive voice. But we're not going to do the hope fall because I'm just piling on at this point. And uh, it's not going to add much to our knowledge base So at this stage. So. Uh, I almost did, but I said, nah, I'm not going to do it. Um, so the he fall uh, stem is going to express the causative action with an active voice. I want to make it passive. I'm just going to go to the hoop fall, hoop fall. Uh, but we're going to stay with the active voice. So the he fall passive should be he fall active. Again, that's my error. Active. He fall active, and there we see the word there. Uh, let's see. Uh, himli. Uh, well, I don't have a vowel there. I think I should have a vowel. Let me see. Under the... Uh, yeah, I can't pronounce it without a vowel, so some, something's not quite right. So I'll have to look at that. I'm not going to try to pronounce it because it's missing something. Uh, it's translated, but it we translated, he caused to rain. This is from the word melek, uh, uh, you know, for uh, a king or, or to rain. Uh, and to make it uh, uh, active, he followed to make it something causative, he caused to rain. So he caused someone to rain. Uh, he made someone king. Um, and to the he fall in perfect conjugation, third masculine singular. Uh, we have the katal on the left. We've already talked about it multiple times. Notice the difference. There's two different forms, okay? Sometimes you can get words that are spelled two different ways, and it's the same word. They do it in English, but I forgot to look up some words you might think off the top of your head, words that are really spelt the same, uh, uh, but uh, are spelt differently, but actually the same word. Uh, I think, I, I don't know, I won't go too far. I hadn't looked at it. So uh, here the difference is, is notice that we add a, a, a hey, uh, the constant hey in the uh, prefix uh, with a hyric, uh, and the ending is going to be uh, on the 
first one on the left is going to have the heric iode embedded into it an in infix. Um, and the one on the right is going to have the podic on the third, second root position. Notice in both cases, it's the second root position that the vowels changed. The difference is, is the, uh, on one of them, the one on the right, uh, uh, let's see, hik, uh, hiktalta, hiktalta, yeah, uh, has a tav, uh, a tav with a comates hay ending versus just the lamid ending. Uh, on the one on the left. I don't know why. Uh, there's just two different forms of the same thing. Uh, both a causative, completed action, active voice. And so when we look at the form, uh, and we're going to look at just one form of it, uh, compared to the call, the, the again, the perfect suffix endings are the same. You've already seen them. If you were doing the grammar, you'd already learned them. You wouldn't have to learn anything new here. Only thing new you would learn would be the prefix. And notice the prefix, how consistent it is. It's the hey with a heric. The difference is going to be is what uh, the second root position. That's often where you'll see the change. Um, and in this case, the first third masculine singular is going to have a heric yod. Remember, that's a vowel that's not a constant, a heric yod. Um, but some of them, well, such as the second masculine singular, will have the potic underneath the second root position. Uh, and so you get he caused to kill, she caused to kill, you caused to kill, I caused to kill, they caused to kill, and so forth. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, um, yeah, I think that's, I want to verify something real quick. Let me look at something here. Let's see if I can perfect. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so the, uh, the suffix endings uh, are exactly the same, uh, and so there's nothing new that you have to learn in that regard. Uh, so when you look at though, you go from the hefel perfect, uh, which of course is a completed action. Hefel is active voice. You're going to stay in active voice, and the hefel imperfect. Imperfect is going to be incomplete action, uh, and so you have yito. Uh, and the call in perfect third masculine singular, it's an incompleted simple action after voice. To make it causative, you know you're going to go to heat fell. To make it uh, incomplete action, you're going to stay, you have imperfect. Uh, the heat fell is also an active voice. And so you have, you have uh, yachtil, yachtil, yachtil. Uh, uh, and notice the change there is the podic underneath the first position, uh, where typically you might see a heric. Now you have the podic there. Uh, and then the second root position, uh, excuse me, the podic under the, uh, uh, the prefix. This first root position is the kof. Uh, the tet is the second root position and has the heric yod there. And so you've made it now an active voice, but an incomplete action, still causative. Uh, for example, you could see uh, the comparison to the call and the heap fell in the imperfect. He will cause to kill. So in this case, they're putting it all in the future. Um, and so you go from, uh, you know, so the call third masculine singular has the starts with the yod and the pre and the prefix, but has the heric in the call, but the podic in the uh, uh, fill. And you see the podic carries all the way through on that heat fill on that first uh, or that prefix to it. Um, the as a result that uh, you know the and the second root uh, position where the tet is. It has the heric yod all the way through. And those are characteristics that you easily kind of get to follow. And so now you've gone through, you know, of the seven uh, uh, verbal stems, ben yanim, uh, you've gone through uh, five of them. Uh, and the only thing you haven't done is take the fall into the hope fell, which is going to make it passive. And then you have the intensive uh, reflective, the hephael, which we, you know, we're not going to spend time on. But you see, there is a pattern. And I know it looks like a lot, but once you learn the pattern to one, it applies to the other. Uh, and it's not so massive. Uh, now, this pattern does get impacted when you go, when you add uh, what we said call the weak consonants. The, the hey is weak, the yod is weak, uh, some other consonants are weak, and they can cause the olive is weak, and the ion is weak, uh, and they can cause some changes in the spelling. Um, but you recognize those are weak and you know it's going to change and you begin to recognize those too. So Hebrew, and truthfully, is easier than Greek. 
it looks like a lot more because number one, you don't, you're not familiar with the symbols that are used for the alphabet. It looks like a lot more because it has a much, a lot of variations as a result of uh, uh, applying seven stems, seven binyanim, and uh, upwards of uh, what we say, uh, uh, eight different conjugations across all seven. Although that's not really 100% accurate because the imperative is only done in certain ones and the accordative and Joseph are only done in certain ones. So it's not really a one-to-one -one relationship there. But my point is, is that uh, even though it looks very complex, once you sort of begin to recognize the pattern, it's not so insurmountable. Uh, it's still a lot, and there's no doubt. It's a new language. Greek's a new language, so it's still a lot. Uh, but uh, it is manageable. Carl? The average person, uh, I mean, were they learning this one? I mean, when they looked at it. Who's that? The average person who was a Hebrew. I know they, they didn't have a printing press and they have a lot of, there weren't a lot of documents. So, it's, I mean, this was, every, everyone didn't, one able to, was everyone able to read, I guess I'm saying, or right. well, the, the children in small school learned to, they would start out with the alphabet and learn the different symbols too. Sure. Uh, very much like, well, let me say this a couple of different things, a couple of different points related to that. Uh, you know, when, when you raise your children, uh, they learn English because you speak English and, and everything around them is English and it becomes something they, uh, and understand when kids learn a language, they didn't learn it overnight. They're learning from the time they're born. And when do they actually start speaking and actually recognizing words and actually being able to write words? It takes a few years. All right. So people will say, hey, you learn much easier when you're younger. There's some truth to that because your mind's not cluttered, but it still takes a long time. Uh, but because you learn it as you go, it's really intuitive in that sense. It's not intuitive to us because we are, we're not immersed in it. And we're already immersed in something else that makes it, in English, that makes it harder for us to sort of, uh, we're still thinking in English. They're thinking in Hebrew. Uh, when, we, when our kids grow up in English, they're thinking in English. Uh, they're recognizing in English uh, what Hebrew is recognizing in Hebrew. Now, I'll add this to it. Uh, it varies between, uh, you know, who you speak to and what they say, but generally speaking, most, the vast majority could not read or write, whether it be Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek. Uh, in the first century, uh, the Aramaic was probably the most spoken language in Palestine. But the common uh, written language was Greek. That's how they communicated for transactions to purchase things and such. Uh, Hebrew was still a, uh, a, uh, a language associated specifically with the Hebrews. A Semitic language, the, uh, uh, the Akkadians uh, and some others, uh, uh, Ugaritic uh, related languages still existed, but they were all dying language. Hebrew was a dying language even then. Uh, notice how difficulty they had with uh, the reason we have the Septuagint, uh, the reason we have uh, uh, the Septuagint is because uh, the dispersion of the Hebrew, the uh, Israelites uh, from Babylon uh, to uh, well, the Syrians to Babylon and the Romans, the, the dispersion of the, uh, the Jews uh, basically meant that they didn't, weren't immersed in Hebrew anymore. And uh, so the uh, the Masoretic text came around around 200 or 500 AD to preserve something. Hebrew did not have the consonants written in it. And today, modern Hebrew, certain places, they still don't put the consonants in there because they intuitively recognize the word. Uh, like I could do melech right away. I could recognize it without the verbal, without the, uh, uh, the vowel pointers in there. They're not technically vowels or pointers because they were added in 500. They learned to speak with the vowels, but the written, they didn't use them because they recognized them. Uh, and so uh, it, where it seems difficult to us, uh, they grew up with it and it'd be more intuitive. Even those who didn't really know, they still learned some. If you're around it, you're still going to pick up something. Uh, the estimates are that when you get outside of the wider metro, metropolitan areas, metropolis areas, it's probably estimates of 10% were able to uh, read and less, even less could write. Uh, in the metropolis areas, uh, whether it be in Alexandria or Jerusalem, I imagine Jerusalem would be a higher number for Hebrew. Alexander, 
uh, probably a higher number than say Rome or Athens and such. Uh, but uh, uh, the percentages vary, uh, that would be more like upwards of 20% can read and even less can write. One of the reasons there are scribes, they were people who were trained in writing, uh, where other people can read, can recognize a symbol, but they couldn't write, uh, kind of thing. So, uh, and that, you know, is debatable how much could read, how many could write, I don't really know. So, but, uh, that helped. Yeah, it does. I just, I know, I've been accused of that or hand penmanship. I can imagine the average person trying to, if you miss one little symbol, yeah. you've thrown it all off. And if you're in a hurry writing very fast, you could have, it, it wouldn't be recognizable. To and what does Jesus say that, uh, that, uh, that not one uh, jot or tittle, tittle will be uh, uh, vanished away, vanished away until, until he's fulfilled all, fulfilled that, that, all? That takes on a whole new meaning. Absolutely. And uh, we didn't go into jot tittles. Uh, basically, there are markers that were added uh, associated with the uh, uh, typically the, the pronunciation or the. Uh, actually, I'm not an expert, so I won't go too far with it. But there were markers that were added uh, for a jot and tittle. They were to be the smallest marks that were added in the text. If you actually look at the Hebrew Bible, we're seeing the vowel pointers, and we're only focusing on vowel pointers. There's a whole lot of other marks that are there, and they have different meanings, but they are not directly associated with the meaning of the word. Uh, they might be associated with some other aspects of the word or the sentence itself. Uh, so, okay, so I do want to go and continue because we're going to finish a little early. Uh, I want to go into uh, look at uh, the practical exegesis. Uh, we have, other than last week, spent some time looking at the exegetical principles where we looked at a couple of different books at word studies going beyond the word study and making sure we're looking at the entire context, the big picture from the meta narrative across to all the scripture uh, down to the word and even the morphology, uh, the components of the word. Uh, all those have value and all have meaning uh, and everything in between, uh, recognizing the author, the audience, uh, and several other aspects are significant in our word studies. Uh, but I wanna spend a little time, and this will be a little different, we haven't really done this, uh, and look at a word study Actually, I had to do it in school a while back uh, on uh, uh, some related Hebrew words. The, we're going to read uh, now. The, the slide is going obviously Hebrew. Remember, goes right to left. But I'm going to start on the left. Uh, the very first word is Amar. Uh, that's the word on the left, Amar, and that means to say. Um, now, the next word are all derivatives of the same word. They're from Davar. And which means to speak or means word in the noun form. And so what I want to do is a little comparison between them. And hopefully we don't you know, get too deep or get too lost here. Uh, uh, I, 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 I know, uh, well, let's, let's just see where we're at. So uh, Amar, if you look up the lexicon, it's used 5,183 times. That's a lot. Uh, it means typically to say, to speak, to declare, to command, to think, to tell, to attend, to order, and a whole bunch of other meanings. Um, if we look at its background, its etymology, where does it come from? Um, and and it is, this is significant in the sense that in Semitic languages, Ugaritic languages, Arcadian languages, and they, have, they borrow words, just like our English borrows from Greek, borrows from Latin, and borrows from the Romance languages, so French and and uh, uh, Italian and such. Uh, most of our medical terms actually come from the Greek. Uh, you know, so languages do share across each other. So Semitic languages, Semitic roots, and this is really important, not so much for the Mar, but really important if you come across a Hebrew word that uh, is only used one time and uh, some question about its meaning or usage. Well, oftentimes what you do is you look at related languages, so other Semitic languages. Uh, Ugaritic or Akkadian and these kind of things. And so uh, a lot of uh, tools, in this case, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, uh, will provide some etymolog etymological information, including its relationship to other languages. And I deleted some of this because there's some other Ugaritic and Akkadian references that, that I thought was just going to get too complex here uh, for, for our study tonight. Uh, but Amar is a common, has a common Semitic root which generally can mean to be bright, to be visible, to make visible, to see, or to inform. 
And uh, there is an etymological connection between the Ugaritic to be visible and to see, uh, and the connection and its relationship with Hebrew Amar is not disputed by many scholars anymore. It was at one time. There are disputes about uh, Amar's rela Hebrew Amar in relation to some other language, related language, uh, Akkadian and Ethiopian. Uh, I remember the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Where did it come from? Where is he going? Okay, so there's a similar uh, Semitic language. Uh, but in Hebrew uh, the Bib and Biblical Aramaic, uh, which is also a Semitic related language, uh, the original meaning, which the original meaning to be bright, to be visible, to make visible, to see, uh, it recedes entirely. In other words, it basically falls away, giving away to the concept to say. So there's a, a, a period of time where this word, Amar, actually uh, evolves and, and it focuses its meaning on to say, where you see uh, uh, where originally it might have a, to inform, uh, but the other related meanings to be bright, to be visible, to make visible. And you can see where those might actually have something to do to, to inform. It's something that's visible, something to make visible, to see, would be something that you could make inform. Uh, so there's a relationship that exists there, uh, sort of a, 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 a sense in, in its relationship. Uh, but those meanings dropped off uh, in the biblical uh, Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, and with the emphasis focusing on the concept to say, in other words, imparting information. So I'm going to dive a little deeper with this and bring out a couple of things here. Uh, so Amar, in its root, uh, we mentioned to say, to mention, to think, to command. We said about over 5,000 times. The vast majority uh, is uh, the very first root there, root there is Amar, meaning to say, to mention, to think is over 5,100 times. The other usages, including, uh, uh, notice this, the third one, uh, the second one down, not counting the root, okay? You start with uh, Amar, meaning to say, to mention, to think, the second one down is, uh, it's hard for me to read that text, let me look up here. Um, Amur, uh, Amur meaning word. I wanna point that out. I want you to recognize that, okay, there are other root uh, uh, words that come from that root and so Amar is to say, typically, and that's the vast majority, but there is other usages uh, from that root, uh, such as uh, uh, Amer, uh, which means the word, or a word, and of course then you have some other usages, including names uh, type of thing. So just point that out, I'm gonna bring that out here in the next minute. Uh, talk about Amar and its meaning. Uh, Amar always indicates some reasonable statement by a subject which is heard and understood. In other words, uh, it's not uh, 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 something that, uh, it, it's something that would be understood. It's a statement made that's, that's recognizable and, and understood by others. Its purpose is never to describe the technique of speaking, but to call attention to what is being said. In other words, its focus is always the content of what's being said. Um, therefore, Omar always appears in a subject-object relationship. Carl, you're the subject, uh, and I'm the object, and you say to me, Carl said to Dave, there we have, Amar, Carl, Amar, Dave, um, subject-object relationship. And it's referring to not how you said something, but the content of what you said. That's what it's referring to. Um, Amar always expresses a personal relationship, no matter what it may be. Amar functions in all phases of social life, culture, custom, law, religion. That's why we see it, see it in over 5,100 times. Uh, in all human relationships with regard to classes, personal feelings, teaching, learning, wisdom, foolishness, communication, and isolation. Uh, so it's used extensively in, in relationships, no matter what kind of relationship, including man's relationship to nature, man's relationship to the world, man's relationship to creation, and in relationship between God and man and man and God. Okay, so... It, 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 it's talking about the context. It's referring to what's being said uh, in relationship from the subject to the object, uh, generally. Uh, and so let's look at the sense of it. The, and I want to point out something here, and I don't know how well you can see it on your slides or on the TV or at home, uh, but the sense uh, to say starts with the action to speak or to say an action and, and then you notice that we uh, highlighted to utter, 
which leads to to say or to express something. That's the vast majority of the sense that's being used for Amar in the Hebrew. Uh, of the 50 over 5,300 times, 5,100 times has this sense to express something. But I want to point out that uh, the related word we're going to look at, davar, uh, also has a meaning to say and to express. The only difference is it's, it's only 66 times versus out of its 1,100 plus times. Has it, does it say, does it imply or does it have a reference to the same uh, to say or express? Uh, so both words can be used in the same sense, but predominantly Amar is used for this sense, that is to say express, where Devar can be used in the same sense, but uh, much less often. Uh, Devar as a whole is used much less often, but in relationship to its usage, it's used only 66 out of 1136 times. Uh, and so it also has a sense to speak, uh, to interact, to communicate, and to speak. So Amar can mean to speak, but notice its usage of the 5,300 times, only 69 times really relate to, to speak uh, versus uh, its typical usage of to say, uh, or to express some content information. Um, so it can be used to physically just to speak and not refer to the content, but the action of speaking. However, its related word, Devar, is typically refer used for to speaking. So what I'm saying is that if you see the word devar, the verb devar, it's most times referring about the action of speaking. But if you see the word amar, it's most times referring not about, not about the action of speaking, but the content of what's being said. That's the difference, actually. Both can have the same usage in the same sense, but devar is predominantly used to give the uh, indication of the action of speaking, to speak, uh, and and uh, Amar predominantly used to express the content of saying something. Uh, while both can reverse that, and I lost my, my microphone, so the battery goes to that test test. Let me go get the battery so the guys don't like it. Although they may not be listening, I don't really know. <laughs> I was on a roll, and now I'm off my roll. Oh, well. All right, so I wanted to show you the relationship between uh, and you just find the same thing in the Greek study, the same thing. So when we've done our study so far, we've kind of focused on the word or the context, but understand their relationship with the other related words. And this is what I wanted to highlight and bring out, okay? So, uh, for example, Amar and Devar, both in the verb form. So let's continue in that and looking at that. Um, uh, for, and that, this is a little busy here. I understand that, okay? Uh, but on the left-hand side is some grammatical relationships. So I just want to highlight a couple of things. We're talking about Amar right now, okay? Um, uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, notice that Amar used with the subject, and what's the subject here? Yahweh. The Lord, uh, uh, so uh, Yahweh, or excuse me, uh, 612 times. So predominantly, it seems to be used with God. And so you see, for example, on the right hand side, well, let me finish the left hand side, grammatical relationships. Uh, so you can see it can be used with other words, uh, uh, as with the Lord being the subject, with the Melech, the king being the subject, with Elohim, God, El being the subject, uh, with David. David being the subject, uh, but the vast majority it's associated with Yahweh, uh, uh, God being the, the subject. Um, 
not so much used with the object. Uh, typically, it's not associated with the object. You see, it's very seldom used. But the adverb, in other words, modifying the verb, uh, so oftentimes predominantly with the, 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 uh, the Hebrew word, uh, uh, I think it's key, uh, as like over 500 times. Uh, but notice on the right-hand side, this is sort of this paradigm. And, and, and now that you're experts in the, uh, the call stem, the perfect and imperfect conjugation, and the nephal stem, uh, which is what we have predominantly here. If I had a pointer, I do have a pointer. You guys, pointer doesn't work on the TV though, you see. So I'm gonna point for the guys online and try to talk to. So if you look up top, you have the verb imperfect 2,935 times. It's singular 2,527 times, plural 408 times. So let's stay with the imperfect. Go to the right, you see it's third masculine, uh, 20, uh, the 2,527 times, 21 and 50 is third masculine. And you see the call, and here the call uh, 2,130 times, there's the different spelling forms. And typically what you find, for example, in Genesis 1-3, then God said. What's significant about Amar, then God said, is because it's not referring to the, 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 the method of his speaking, uh, but, or the fact that he's speaking, but the content of what he says. People want to say, well, how does God speak if he doesn't have a lips? He doesn't have a tongue. You know, his spirit, has, he's not talking about the action of speaking. He's talking about the content of what's being said. That's why Amar is being used here. This is a misunderstanding. It's why people don't have a background or understand the, the, the language behind it. And it's really hard to explain from the pulpit. You know, he's not talking about the action of speaking. God spoke the world into existence. Yes, he did. But it's the content of, the, of what he did that's referring to. Um, and so if you go down on the right-hand side, you, we saw the verb imperfect. We'll go to the verb perfect. Remember, per, imperfect is something that's ongoing. It's continuing. I uh, might add here, it says, then God said, said is not ongoing, it's completed. Well, I didn't mention in our class, we didn't really spend any time looking at it. I didn't mention a, what they call the vav consecutive. Uh, and if you put a vav in front of an imperfect word, it's going to act like an imperfect. If you put a vav in front of an imperfect, it's going to act like a perfect. That's exactly what we have here. Uh, in the imperfect, they have the vav in front of it. Uh, and and uh, uh, well, I don't see the valve. I know I looked at it earlier and I saw it elsewhere, so I'm not sure why I see it there. So let me not go too far without looking further. Uh, in the perfect form, uh, the call, uh, is you see the perfect form 1166 times, uh, over a thousand is singular. Uh, most of it is third masculine. Uh, in the call form, uh, there's Amar, uh, uh, 1163 times in the call, the default one time, he fell two times. Uh, and in the uh, call, uh, seven, uh, call third masculine, uh, 752 times. And for example, in Genesis 3, 1, has God said? Uh, and so you can see, and so this kind of gives you a feel for how the word is being used in context. Uh, and then I just wanted to point that out. Any questions as I go too fast? I'm not trying to, trying to look at every aspect of it, but just give you a feel. Uh, the point being is Amar, is, we're speaking to the content of what the message. It's focused on the message, not on the action of speaking. Uh, and so if you look how the uh, Bibles translate, we'll go from bottom left, the New American Standard Bible, Amar, typical meaning is to say, to mention, to think, command. Notice the blue. There is predominantly, uh, he said, uh, and the red on the New American Standard Bible is say, saying, or says. Those are the two biggest usage in the New American Standard Bible. Uh, the King James, very similar. The blue, he said, it's almost very similar in terms of its usage. A little less for the red, he say, or saying, but that's predominantly because the orange is sayeth, King James word. What that means is to say. Uh, so if you combine the two, it's very much the same as the New American Standard Bible. Very consistent is my point. And the NIV is a little different, uh, which it often is. Uh, we're moving more towards a more dynamic translation um, and, and more versus moving closer to paraphrasing. NIV is not paraphrasing. It's more dynamic. Uh, but notice it's less blue, meaning he said, but they still use it quite a bit. 
Uh, they still use the say saying quite a bit, not as often, probably uh, equivalent to what the King James does for say saying versus uh, not to say it, but to say saying. Uh, but then they have other, the NIV would typically have many more uh, uh, translate, uh, ways to translate uh, the word. So this is, gives you a feel for Amar, and now I want to compare it to Devar. Devar and Amar both can be used in the same sense. Uh, and, or related senses. And uh, so when we look at Devar, here's the verb form uh, to speak, to say, to declare, promise, be spoken, converse, I'll think, over 1130 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and we talk about the relationship between Devar and Amar. Uh, in contrast uh, uh, to uh, Amar, Devar has a more comprehensive and overarching sense. It sums up the conversation as a whole at the beginning or the end so that, generally speaking, it should be translated to speak or have a conversation to converse with. In other words, there's emphasis on the fact that they did speak, emphasis on the fact of the, uh, the communication aspect of it and not the content. It's emphasizing that they are communicating, not emphasizing the message. Amar emphasizes the message. Devar emphasizes the communication. Uh, its root, uh, Devar, uh, uh, you see... Uh, to speak or converse over 2,577 times. Uh, the word that we're looking at is uh, the second one there. Uh, it's the second one down. It's got to devar, uh, to speak. Uh, that's where it has over 1130 usage. Uh, we're going to get to the noun, devar, de, de, with the two commates under it, uh, a little uh, after this. But now I'm focusing on the verb. Uh, and it's pro, uh, dominant usage here. Uh, it has, uh, uh, we've already actually touched on this when we looked at Amar in comparison, but here's a little clearer picture. Uh, the blue is typically what it's translated to me. It has a sense to speak. Uh, it uh, can have a sense, as you can see in the red, to say or express, as well as other senses to declare, to promise, to be spoken, to converse, to tell, and so forth, to speak a language, to speak speech, or to, and, and so forth. Uh, same kind of thing looking in the left hand side, uh, its relationship grammatically with Yahweh uh, 208 times in comparison to others. So in other words, these are often used, uh, Amar and Devar are often used in, in God speaking. Oftentimes when Amar is speaking about the content of the message and other times uh, Devar might be more related to the fact of his, uh, the, the, the communication in itself. Uh, uh, not so much uh, heavily with the object as well, but more so than Amar. Amar is not typically used with the direct object, but it can be, uh, Devar can be. The adverb uh, is actually less than. Uh, for on the right-hand side, the verb perfect form uh, is typically, you find it in the PL form. What is PL? PL is intensive action. Intensive action and, uh, and uh, active voice. Uh, versus puel, uh, so the perfect conjugation, pl stem, you see 257 times out of the 437 is the singular, third masculine singular, pl form. Uh, in Genesis 12, 24, the Lord has spoken. Uh, Genesis 21, 1, the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Um, and if you go down to the imperfect form below that, Right here, the verb imperfect, go down 379 times. Again, predominant usage is the PL. Notice it does have PUL, but only one time. What's the difference between PL and PUL? They're both intensive uh, stems, but one is passive, one is active, and one's passive. The PUL is passive. Uh, so you see how it's most often used in the PL form, 378 times. Uh, in the uh, third masculine, it's going to be 231 times and so forth. Uh, for example, in Genesis 8.15, then God spoke to Noah, saying, Genesis 17.3, God talked with him, saying, Genesis 28.8, Ambimelech uh, uh, told all these things. Uh, it's referring to the communicative act, uh, not the message. And that's the big difference here. Uh, and you have infinitives and pa passive participles, which we didn't go over. So. Um, Devar is translations in the Bibles, uh, typically New American Standard, the bottom left-hand corner. You can see it's very similar to the King James uh, in terms of the blue is predominant usage to speak. That is the fact of communication. 
uh, or spoke in the past tense, spoken in the orange. Uh, and the King James, very similar to spake uh, uh, versus speak. Uh, and uh, so even the King James uh, will use uh, spoke, spake and speak, spake being past tense, speak is present and spoken in the orange. NIV has more variation. Uh, uh, it, the blue there is a prominent use of said, uh, but uh, the red is very near the same, speak, speaking or speaks, spoken in the orange and so forth kind of thing. So um, let's see, there's something I was going to bring out. It might come out later. Let me see if it comes out later. Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, now, that's the verb. We looked at the verb Omar and a verb related to Devar. But Devar has, uh, uh, remember, we looked at roots and how a root can form a noun and a verb. Well, we looked at the verb form of Devar. Now we want to, or the Dalit, uh, Bait, and uh, Resh. Now let's look at the noun form, which is used 1,425 times. And notice the difference. The Devar, it almost sounds the same. The biggest difference is the second root position. The second root position in the verb has a potic, that one singular line underneath it. The second root position under the noun, Devar, has the comate. So it has two comates. First position and second position. So it's davar. They sound the same. Uh, the difference really is how long you pronounce the, or how long you, your, the air is allowed to go through and the comates versus the poly, davar uh, versus davar. Uh, very, uh, it's a nuance that I don't really grasp and I couldn't recognize in regular Hebrew speaking, but if you grow up Hebrew, you'd recognize it. Um, uh, a little bit about the etymology, uh, and, 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 and this is, I'm going to just highlight here. I don't want to spend much time because it gets a little complex. Uh, there's some lexicons that see two different he Hebrew roots for Devar, the noun. They see two roots, um, and one will be referring to, to be behind or turn back, and it's related to some Aramaic usage. Uh, there's a English spelling of Dubur. Uh, and the mean an Akkadian meaning the uh, baru meaning to push back and other derivatives. So let's skip that. Or the second would be notice the second bullet would be uh, word, which is kind of how we see it or how we use it. Mostly found in the noun devar, a word thing, and the verb or the pl that we just saw to speak an address. Um, etym etymologically, it's related to devar. Uh, the second one, word, mostly found in the noun of our word thing. Um, and, and our debra, uh, uh, de uh, a thing, and uh, deber, uh, or excuse me, this is deber, uh, it's a double B, a rare uh, form of the verb. Uh, and also uh, midbar, uh, mouth with an instrument uh, memory. Uh, but so there's some lexicons that will recognize two roots, that's the point. But notice the third bullet, or the second major bullet, BDB and GB. BDB is Brown, Drivers, and Briggs. Yeah, GB is, I forget, another Hebrew lexicon. Uh, does, they don't differentiate, they don't see two different roots, they see one root. And notice the last bullet, there's no convincing etymological, uh, etymology for Debar uh, has been offered this time. In other words, they don't know. It could have two roots, you could only have one root. Uh, and again, we're talking about because words share across multiple languages, Semitic languages, they, they, just, they don't just pop up in one language. They're, they grow and evolve from other languages and are shared to other languages. Uh, and so uh, there's not a, a, a settled etymology for Devar in the noun form. Talk about the noun form, okay? And so here we have uh, the root of Devar, uh, to speak or to converse or talk, but notice the second bullet, the second one is the devar, devar, and it's the noun form. The one below that is going to be the verb form, which we already looked at. But the first one, devar, uh, actually we're looking at, excuse me, uh, we're looking at root one and root two. In order to come down to the bottom here, the third line from the bottom. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, some lexicons show two different roots. Uh, so what we're looking at is the second root down here at the bottom, devar, word, matter, fair thing, something, word, a word of God. Uh, uh, now, when you get to the actual 
word devar that we're looking at, uh, they're really the same, no matter which root you're looking at. Word, matter, fair thing, something, word of God, there's no difference. Uh, my point being is that they're, they're not clear of its etymology. etymology. Uh, uh, the meaning of devar, uh, word, speaking, speech, uh, thing, anything, everything, nothing, uh, with negatives. Uh, commandment, matter, act, event, history, account. It's a wide range of meaning. It's much like uh, uh, the Greek word, uh, uh, what's the word for word? Uh, logos uh, in, in Greek. It's a wide range of meanings. Um, the noun is translated 85 different ways in the King James. I mean, that's a wide range of meaning. 85 different ways in the King James Version. Now, uh, the other translations also translate a lot of different meanings uh, for it. Uh, this is due to the necessity of rendering such a fertile word, in other words, it's, it's you know, used everywhere, uh, by the sense it has in varying, varying context. Uh, as word, devar basically means what God said or says. Uh, and Let me catch up on my notes here, see where I'm at. Okay, so when we look at Devar, uh, and we're focusing on uh, the word as a statement or a message communication, that's the base. The first, let's say the first, uh, I think three I've highlighted, uh, the first sense as a statement or the word or the message being communicated or the matter or thing. Uh, and so you can see that out of the... Uh, uh, 525 out of the 1,457 times, 525 it carries a sense of a statement. Uh, uh, out of 1,457 usages, 359 it carries a sense of a message being communicated. Out of 1,457 times, 220 about matter, or 153 things a time about thing or the act itself. Uh, and you see the in the graphic of the right top right does the same thing. Oftentimes the blue there, it refers a sense of a statement uh, or the, and the red, the message being communicated or the or a matter or thing or act and so forth. So uh, the sense of the devour and the sense of a word that is the message content, a statement as a word and we're touched on. Uh, you can see that as a message is has a sense of an abstraction being communicated and so you get the message being communicated and that can expand to whether it's uh, the truth whether it's a voice, whether it's a word, or whether it's a saying, or collection of sayings, or speech. And these are all senses of how that word is used. Uh, and matter being knowledge, cognitive content, uh, you know, your thought process in the matter. Uh, and a thing would be an event, an act or deed. And notice the act or deed could be several things, but uh, the thing or act, is the, it's the thing that's in the action that's referring to. Um, grammatical relationships. Uh, typically, it's used with uh, the subject of uh, hava, meaning he was, or uh, this type of thing, and uh, it's often modified with the adjective uh, God, Yahweh, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, direct object uh, with uh, Shem, uh, he heard. Uh, I want to point out one last word uh, just in relationship, and it's uh, uh, Deber. Uh, it's only used one time. Uh, and notice the difference in spelling. It just uses, all it does is use a different uh, verb, or uh, excuse me, a verb, different uh, vowel pointers, uh, uh, debare. Uh, and debare, yeah. Uh, debare, uh, you see, it's also from the root, uh, from debar, and means a word of God. And one place it's used is word of God, and that is, of course, Jeremiah 5, verse 13, speaking of one who speaks, a uh, form of Jeremiah 5, 13, which is uniformly translated as to bear, the word is not in them. Uh, and it's referring to the word of God is not in them. Uh, uh, and you get the sense of, an again, same kind of sense of a, a, a message being communicated. God's word, his message, is not, is not communicated, but it's not in them. Jeremiah 5.13. And so we see Jeremiah 5.13, we won't do all the Hebrew here, but the red is, uh, I'm going to point to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the going from right to left, okay? The first red is where you have the 
divide, divide. Uh, you have first the, uh, uh, the, the, the vav with the shirk underneath it. That's going to be a conjunction. That's going to be like uh, and or but or also. And then you got the, uh, the hay with the potica underneath it. Well, that's going to be uh, the. Uh, and then you got, there's your root of the dalit, the bait, and the resh. And so you got, and the vowel de bear, uh, and uh, well, that's going to be referred to, and and is the 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 vav, uh, the is the hey, and the word is de bear. So it's vaha de bear, uh, and and the word, and then you get the rest is not in them. Uh, and so that's basically how you come to uh, a comparison. Uh, and here's some references just for your information. Um, I want to just kind of pull out a little bit about, we've been focusing on uh, your word study uh, and, and how it applies, but there is more that you can really look at and see this value that, for example, how uh, Mar relates to uh, uh, Debar, Debar, Debar. Uh, and uh, and how it's used in the Hebrew context. You can do the same thing in the Greek. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, we have in English, a lot of words that are uh, uh, synonyms and we replace it with it. Well, that doesn't mean it has the same sense in every sen every application. Uh, and some application has a completely different, uh, a more nuanced sense than say in, in, a, in, in, in some other application. Uh, in other words, maybe related to that. And so this is the same kind of thing. My point being is there's, more you can add to your study uh, and more you can uh, look at. When I look at words like Amar, uh, it fascinates me to say, oh, well, wait a minute. Um, oftentimes uh, uh, we translate, we say, well, God said, well, I'll find other places, God said is Devar, not Amar. What's the difference? Well, that's when I try to go look at these kind of things. And so, so I wanted to highlight that and bring that to your attention as part of your study. I'm not expecting that in the paper. Uh, it's good to recognize that, um, and, uh, and that's it. any questions. Well, guys, uh, I think uh, I'm missing only two Hebrew papers now, uh, so um, um, yeah, I know, that, and neither one of them are here right now, so that's fine. Uh, so, and uh, so I'll coordinate with them, but uh, I'm going to do my best to get these graded. The three that I have this weekend, uh, I go out of town Monday. So I want to have as much of this done as I can before I leave and get to your grade. So um, I appreciate all your study and your uh, diligence and efforts. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always reach me, email me, call me. I'd be glad to help. I won't have all the answers, but we can use the tools to find the answers. So any other thoughts? Thank you, Brother Dave. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Wilson and all of us, man.